Uh, the reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sally. This morning we're starting a new series um, looking at identity and we're looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians And those of you who were here last week would have heard me talk about the Trinity, and we landed uh, by thinking about the fact that we're all found in Christ, Um, that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are a community of relationships, and we get to join in and we become part of the divine life. God comes to live in us, and we live in Christ, and we live and we move and we have our being in God. And so I want to unpack that a bit more this morning, and I want to start by just thinking about labels because one of the ways that our brain kind of copes with the volume of information and data it gets is to categorize things or people and to label them. There are lots of labels. There are labels on our food, which describe what are the ingredients and how to cook the item. There are labels on our clothes as well, telling us how, what they're made of and how to wash them. And if you filled in the census information a while back, you would have been asked about your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, age, education, employment, and income. And so in terms of labels, just to be fully transparent, uh, uh, the, box, the, forms that I, the, the boxes that I ticked on the form will tell you that I'm uh, a heterosexual, middle-aged, I hate that phrase, but there we go, middle-aged, another one, um, female, these aren't very sticky, I'm full-time employed. This is getting a bit awkward. Uh, I'm also heterosexual. Go put that down here. Uh, Oh, and I'm a priest. That's over my microphone. Uh, I'm a mother. That one there. Uh, Oh, and uh, yeah, so I think that's kind of enough for the moment, okay? So we've all got labels, and um, actually there are five different categories just for our relationship status legally. There's married, widowed, separated, divorced, or single. Uh, There are labels to describe our sexuality, so we might be heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, questioning, Uh, and people's gender might be male, female, non-binary, or transgender. We also use labels to describe our employment, whether we're retired or unemployment, full-time, part-time. And let's be honest, we also make assumptions and label people based on how they look, what they wear, and how they speak. We label people's class uh, uh, based on their educational background. So if it's in any help, I'm middle class. I'm running out of space, appropriate space anyway. Oh, dear, they're all falling off. Okay, so as you can see, this is my visual aid, we are 
We are people who label other people. So I've just labeled myself. Could you now turn to the person next to you and using whatever labels you are comfortable with, describe who you are to the person next to you. Did I not mention this was interactive? Off you go. Turn to the person next to you and describe who you are based on your labels. Okay, I think that should be long enough. I've got a feeling you didn't actually have a conversation about that either. Okay, so we're gonna come back now from our conversations. Did anybody actually do the exercise I asked? Anybody? Oh, thank you, you did, well done. So labels are a part of life, and um, in some ways we always have to organize, recognize, and kind of classify and sort people. But the labels that we use to identify others can also be really divisive. And they can be painful and honestly, often just untrue. And yet they stick to us like Velcro, or they don't stick like these ones, and we can't often shed them. My father-in-law, Pete, was once on a counseling course and he was learning about how we project what we think and feel onto other people. And they did this exercise. Uh, and you had to turn to the person next to you that you've never met and say, you remind me of dot, dot, dot. You must be very dot, 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 and you make me feel dot, dot, dot. And so the person next to Pete said, you remind me of Sebastian Coe. You must be very sporty. You make me feel physically inadequate. <laughs> <laughs> and Pete laughed because he's six foot four. He's very slim, but he hasn't been for a run in his entire life. He's the least athletic person uh, I know. So our labels can be really unhelpful and inaccurate. And sometimes we use labels a bit like a kind of cozy jumper. Our labels go before us to announce to others what our needs are. And we can identify, begin to identify with uh, the things that we struggle with, perhaps our anxiety or our depression, and lose who we really are underneath. Or our identity can be about what we do and not who we are, or can become overly focused on a particular aspect of us and not the whole of us. And sometimes labels can be really confusing. Um, just for, again, openness, sometimes people tell me that I'm quite matter-of-fact and direct. And the way that they tell that to me, I, I'm assuming that they find it a little bit offensive or they find it quite difficult. But then I take that to my work mentor and she starts talking to me about clean language, which is management speak for it's really good just to state clearly what you think and feel. And she thinks that's a great thing, so I'm totally confused. I'm also direct, and is that a good thing? A bad thing, or does it just depend on who you speak to? Direct. There we go. And just to sort of throw this in, you know, women, when they're assertive, are often told that they're bossy, but when men are assertive, they're praised for their leadership. It, you know, this is where labels can be unhelpful. And they don't really necessarily describe every situation that we find ourselves in. They're often incomplete, uninformed, and never give the complete picture. So human beings were not designed to be understood in these kinds of categories. And actually, we're not equipped to label others. Only God, as the creator, is equipped to label others and is qualified to do that. And so over all of these sort of man-made human labels that we attach to ourselves, to other people, which may or may not be fair or accurate, God tells us who we are. And as Christians, what God says about us should be the first and final word. Who God says we should are should be our foundation and form our identity. His voice should be loudest. Last week, we said that when we come to faith, we join God's family. And baptism is a marker on that journey of faith. So rather than doing our own thing and being unmoored and directionless, we join the life of God. We join a spiritual family, a church family, and Paul says in this passage that we are adopted into God's family. 
And in our passage, Paul was writing to a group of believers in Ephesus, a diverse group of Jews and non-Jews from a whole variety of different backgrounds who frankly didn't have much in common. And he writes to them to tell them that in the family of God, they're all equal. And that Jesus wanted to create a new humanity that was totally united. He says, God has gone to great lengths to find you, to bring you home. And what unites you is, and what you have in common is that you are all in Christ. And that is much more important than any human label. So when we're in Christ, we're made new and our differences are secondary to our primary calling as a new creation or adopted members of God's family. And Paul uses this language of adoption uh, because in Roman times, uh, when, when, when he wrote this letter, adoption actually was mainly for adults. Occasionally, a relative would adopt a, a, a children whose parents had died, but most of the time, adoption in the Roman culture meant finding an heir to the family fortune for somebody who had no heirs. And so an, an appropriate um, person would be found, usually the brightest and the best person, and they would legally become the son or the daughter or the heir. And so Julius Caesar adopted his great nephew Octavian, who became Emperor Augustus, and Augustus adopted his, his stepson, who became Emperor Tiberius. So the heir would be in their 20s or their 30s, and once they were adopted, uh, according to Roman law, their past would be totally rewritten uh, to reflect their new identity. And all the old debts would be paid in, in full. Legal, uh, legal obligations would change, and their name would change to reflect the fact that they were part of this new family. They were, uh, they were the, the, the heir to the family fortune. But the adoptee in Roman times was always chosen for their merit because they had to be worthy. So Paul takes this idea of adoption, and he says that actually when we put our faith in God, we're adopted as sons and daughters into his family. We become the heir. And that, the idea in the first century that, that God would adopt an unworthy human being was pretty mind-blowing. So Paul is, is saying we become members of the household. We're not servants or slaves, but we become sons and daughters with all the privileges that go with it. And God initiated this. He chose us. He chose you before the world began to be in Christ and Paul uses this phrase 80 times in the New Testament, being in Christ. You see the labels are just dropping off. He says, once we're in him, we have access to every spiritual blessing. In him, we have direct access to the Father. We're wanted, that we're no accident. We're not an unworthy visitor or an intruder. You and I were handpicked by God for a relationship with him, not because of our worthiness or our merit, but because of God and his love for us. So we were chosen in order to be in Christ. Long before we had heard of God or had any interest or knowledge of Christ, he saw us, he chose us, and he wanted us to come home to join the family. And this word predestined can be a bit tricky, but Paul is saying that God's plan all along was to draw people to himself, almost as though it's their destiny to respond to God's invitation. And sometimes we do have those moments, don't we, where we feel as though everything has just led us to a particular moment, as though we're being pulled in like a magnet back home, like everything has finally converged at that place of being found and adopted by God. And this is what Paul is talking about. God chose us. God chose you from the beginning of time. He chose you to belong to him. And so we're no longer categorized and labeled and pigeonholed by our gender, sexuality, age, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. We're identified as sons and daughters of God, found in Christ, uh, chosen by him and wanted by him. And it's not that our gender, sexuality, age, race, ethnicity or background isn't important. It is important. It's part of us. And God does not want us to disregard our uniqueness and what makes us distinctive. Our differences are what makes the church diverse and beautiful, but it is our absolute identity in Christ that is, um, that is more important. We bring all of ourselves, every unique part of us, uh, our background, our culture, into this new life in Christ. And so, over all of our labels, hang on, this is not gonna work now, is it? <laughs> 
Right, over all our labels. Imagine you're covered in labels, right? Some are good, some are bad, some are true. Probably a lot of them are untrue. But over all of our labels, what happens is when we come to be in Christ, we are given a kind of supreme label. Which is adopted. And all of the labels that you have carried up to this point are basically under this overall uh, overarching identity of being adopted and found in Christ. And we're no longer defined by our past, our failures, our weaknesses, our human labels. We are defined and told who we are by God. Right, you've got the, you've got the, uh, okay, I'm going to take this off because it's interfering with my microphone. So over all of our labels, we are adopted. No, that's not going to work. Okay. Too many of us, I think, live under the weight and the shame of our past and all that we've come through. But when we are in Christ and we join God's family, a profound change takes place. And the message version of, in this passage says it's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. And this sense of homecoming is sealed by the Holy Spirit who promises to come and live within us. And the Holy Spirit is like a down payment or a deposit that says that we belong to God. So I just want to finish by highlighting that in this first verse of this letter, Paul writes to the people and he calls them saints. He says, to the saints who are in Ephesus who are believers in Jesus. And to be a saint is basically just to say that we are holy or set apart or consecrated. It doesn't apply that we are the spiritual elite, we're certainly not, or that we're exceptionally holy, but it marks us out as God's people and we're saints. So whilst we are adopted into God's family and in Christ and we're blessed and we have access to God and we become a new creation, actually it comes with a burden of responsibility. It's as though we need to live up to the calling in our lives to honor God's spirit that comes and lives within us. And right at the end of this letter, in chapter four, Paul says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of this calling. So baptism is a marker or it's a sign, a public sign of us and our children joining the family of God. And this passage says that we become saints when we come to faith, that we join or are adopted into God's family. We become sons and daughters with access and privilege. And Paul is urging us to live up to that calling, not to be kind of distracted or swayed by what other people think of us, not to live according to the way that the world labels us, and not to be derailed either and behave in a way that is beneath us as sons and daughters of God. Because to be adopted implies responsibility. We're adopted so that we bear the family likeness. We're chosen to resemble the family that we come from. And so adoption is both a privilege and a responsibility. Paul is encouraging us to, as representatives of the family, to live in a way that honors the family name. Now, let's just return to our labels for a moment because all of our clothes have labels. And I wonder, if we all came with a label, what does your label say about you? If it was Naomi, it would say, made by God, forgiven, chosen, adopted, found in Christ, a saint. It describes who we are in God and as God sees us. But I often cut off the labels on my clothes because they're uncomfortable and scratchy. And in the same way, I think some of us also walk around with labels that are painful and that have stuck to us like Velcro when they aren't true and they're uncomfortable and scratchy to live with. And I think God wants us to cut those labels off and to be willing to put them aside and to step into our calling as sons and daughters of God. And he wants his voice to be the loudest. But that's a choice because we can choose to feed the lies about who we are and what we are or, or be who others have said that we are or we can cut them off and choose to step into the identity that God has for us. So what labels do you carry and live with that aren't helping you, that are uncomfortable and scratchy and are just dragging you down? What labels do you have that aren't life-giving, that don't serve a purpose, or perhaps that are just completely out of date, 
that no longer describe who you are. Maybe it's time to take them off, to cut them off and to step into the identity and the calling of a child of God, adopted, chosen and blessed, and to allow for that voice to be the loudest in your head, telling you who you are. And maybe this is what God is calling out of you today. Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge that that in this world we label and sort and categorize people and partly we have to do do so out of necessity, but we also label others and label and receive labels from others that aren't true, that are more of a reflection of, of the other person than they are of us. And some of the labels that we've received and allowed to be stuck to us are unhelpful and, um, and damaging. And they don't describe who we are. We thank you that when we come to faith and we are adopted into your family, all of those labels can just fall off us, that they are no longer sticky. And I pray, Father God, that as children uh, in your family and sons and daughters, that we would step into that calling of, of being representatives for you in this world and that we would act and speak and behave out of a place of knowing that we are beloved, that you sing over us, that we are precious to you, that we are your children, that we have access to you and all the privileges that come with being a member of your family. Help us to act and to speak and to think in a way that honours the family likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to stand now to sing, and I just encourage you in the next couple of uh, worship songs to bring to mind any of the unhelpful labels that you've heard uh, over your time and offer them to God. And in the same way that mine have all magically fallen off during my sermon this morning, ask him to make them no longer sticky so that they just come off and that God's voice telling you who you are is the loudest that you'll hear. Let's worship.